Hi, You Can Heal family. My name is Conchina, and today we're looking at Psalm 78. I trust and pray that you're having a great day or you're looking forward to a great day ahead. Psalm 78, God's continued guidance in spite of unbelief. So this should be good. This is a pretty long chapter. So enjoy. Oh, my people, listen to my teaching. Open your ears to what I'm saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and know, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children, but will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell of his power and the mighty miracles he did. For he issued his decree to Jacob. He gave his law to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, that they in turn might teach their children. So each generation can set its hope anew on God, remembering his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors. And that kind of reminds me all the mistakes you made growing up. If you have children, it's an opportunity, you know, to teach them differently so they don't make the mistakes that we did. All right, it goes on to say, then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. And two, you know, we have to choose for ourselves, even our children, God. They can't get to heaven because we have a relationship with the Lord. They've got to form their own, but we need to be able to lead them to Christ and, um, you know, teach them the importance of reading the word every day and talking to God and building their own relationship with him. Verse 9 says, The warriors of Ephraim, though fully armed, turned their backs and fled when the day of battle came. They did not keep God's covenant, and they refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonderful miracles he had shown them. The miracles he did for their ancestors in Egypt on the plain of Zoan, where he divided the sea before them and led them through. The water stood up like walls beside them. In the daytime, he led them by a cloud, and at night by a pillar of fire. He split open the rocks of the wilderness to give them plenty of water as from a gushing spring. He made streams pour from the rock, making the waters flow down like a river. Okay, I needed to go for God there. <clears throat> and our foundational scripture for this channel is Psalm 42.1, where it says, in paraphrase, we're like a deer panning after the Lord, you know, needing water to keep us going and it's the washing of the water of the word that refreshes us daily so we go for god amen yet verse 17 they kept on with their sin rebelling against the most high in the desert they willfully tested god in their hearts demanding the foods they craved they even spoke against god himself saying god can't give us food in the desert yes he can strike a rock so water gushes out, but he can't give his people bread and meat. When the Lord heard them, he was angry. The fire of his wrath burned against Jacob. Yes, his anger rose against Israel, for they did not believe God or trust him to care for them. But he commanded the skies to open. He opened the doors of heaven and rained down manna for them to eat. He gave them bread from heaven they ate the food of angels. God gave them all they could hold. He released the east wind and the heavens and guided the south wind by his mighty power. He rained down meat as thick as dust, birds as plentiful as the sands along the seashore. He caused the birds to fall within their camp and all around their tents. The people ate their fill. He gave them what they wanted. But before they finished eating this food, they had craved while the meat was yet in their mouths. The anger of God rose against them, and he killed their strongest men. He struck down the finest of Israel's young men. But in spite of this, the people kept on sinning. They refused to believe in his miracles. 
So he ended their lives in failure and gave them years of terror. God is not going to force us to love him, to like him, and to follow him. It's something called free will that he gives us. And we have to choose him, you know. He's there for us, and like he gave manna, but they still wanted to do things their way. Like, he'll provide for you, but you've got to want him to and want to do our part as well. Verse 34 says, when God killed some of them, the rest finally sought him. Okay, so some people realize we better get our act together here. They repented and turned to God. Then they remembered that God was their rock that their Redeemer was the Most High, but they followed him only with their words. Oh, geez. They lied to him with their tongues. Their hearts were not loyal to him. And see, that's so true. We have to, our hearts have to change. And, and I, you go back, you know, to your children or anybody you have influence over. It's not what you say to them. It's what they see in your actions that they, that they learn from and they follow. And, and these people were, were speaking with their tongues, but their hearts weren't loyal to him. They did not keep his covenant, verse 38. Yet he was merciful and forgave their sins and didn't destroy them all. Many a time he held back his anger and did not unleash his fury. For he remembered that they were merely mortal, gone in a moment like a breath of wind, never to return. And life is so short. Oh, how often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved his heart in the wilderness. Again and again, they tested God's patience and frustrated the Holy One of Israel. They forgot about his power and how he rescued them from their enemies. They forgot his miraculous signs in Egypt, his wonders on the plain of Zonan. For he turned the rivers into blood so no one could drink from their streams. He sent vast swarms of flies to consume them and hordes of frogs to ruin them. He gave their crops to caterpillars. Their harvest was consumed by locusts. He destroyed their grapevines with hail and shattered their sycamores with sleet. He abandoned their cattle to the hail, their livestock to bolts of lightning. He loosed on them his fierce anger, all his fury, rage, and hostility. He dispatched against them a band of destroying angels. He turned his anger against them. He did not spare the Egyptians' lives, but handed them over to plagues. He killed the oldest son in each Egyptian family, the flower of youth throughout the land of Egypt. But he led his own people like a flock of sheep, guiding them safely through the wilderness. He kept them safe so they were not afraid. But the sea closed in upon their enemies he brought them to the border of his holy land, to this land of hills he had won for them. He drove out the nations before them. He gave them their inheritance by lot. He settled the tribes of Israel into their homes. Oh, go for God here. I'm drinking plain black tea because I do a clean fast every day. And I eat within a window a certain amount of hours a day usually between four and six I'll eat and the rest of the time I drink water or black tea or um, green tea so that's called a clean fast and I learned all this from a woman named Jen Stevens G-I-N Stevens and she has something called a 28 day fast and you can learn about it there it's on a podcast and audible so if you wanted to know I thought I'd share that with you and um, I've been feeling a lot better and um, looking better. So I thank God for that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 56. And let me just say, I'm doing, I'm learning about intermittent fasting because I have a lot of gut health things going on. It's not so much for weight loss, but just to try to figure out some things with me. So, you know, look at yourself, look at your body and, and how you're feeling and figure out what it is you need to do to get you where you want to be. Amen? So let's continue. We're on verse 56. There are 72 verses in this chapter. Yet though he did all this for them, they continued to test his patience. They rebelled against the Most High and refused to follow his decrees. 
They turned back and were as faithless as their parents had been. They were as useless as a crooked bow. They made God angry by building altars to other gods. They made him jealous with their idols. When God heard them, he was very angry and he rejected Israel completely. Then he abandoned his dwelling at Shiloh, the tabernacle where he had lived among the people. He allowed the ark of his might to be captured. He surrendered his glory into enemy hands. <clears throat> he gave his people over to be butchered by the sword. Because he was so angry with his own people, his special possession. Oh, we're God's special possession. He loves you so much. But it goes back to he's not going to force, force himself on you. He's so patient and so kind with you. And um, I know he's pleased that you're hearing the word today. I know that. Verse 63 says, Their young men were killed by fire. Their young women died before singing their wedding songs. Oh, no. Their priests were slaughtered, and their widows could not mourn their deaths. Then the Lord rose up as though waking from sleep, like a mighty man aroused from a drunken stupor. He routed his enemies and sent them to eternal shame. But he rejected Joseph's descendants. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. He chose instead the tribe of Judah. And we know Jesus comes from the, the lion, the king, the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. There he built his tower and sanctuary as solid and enduring as the earth itself. He chose his servant David, calling him from the sheep pens. He took David from tending the ewes and lambs and made him the shepherd of Jacob's descendants, God's own people, Israel. He cared for them with a true heart and led them with skillful hands. Praise God. And we know that Jesus came from that line, Judah. Now in this chapter, there's a breakout session which shares a little bit about the his history of Israel. So I'm sitting and I'm seeing one of my first daycare child get dropped off. So I'll just start reading a little bit of this and it's in the Open Bible, New Living Translation on page 772, if you wanna finish that. It says, the biblical history of Israel covers 1800 years and represents a marvelous panorama of God's gracious working through promise, miracle, blessing, and judgment. Israel begins as only a promise to Abraham. For over 400 years, the people of Israel rely on that promise, especially during the period of bondage to Egypt. So as I said, that's coming from Psalm 78, verse four. And if you wanna go ahead and finish that yourself, you can and get that history and knowledge of Israel. I wanna thank you so much for listening to Psalm 78. Um, eight, it was a long one, but hopefully you learned something. And always remember, true healing begins with self-love. Why? Because God is love and Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Bye for now. Okay, you can heal family. I'm back. I've got little baby Ezra in my arms. So he's going to hear the word. And we're going to actually finish up <laughs> this little breakout section. And I think that... Um, He'll cooperate a little bit. He is bedding up right now, though. Oh, my goodness. All right, hold on, you guys. I'm going to grab his burp cough, and then we're going to try to finish this chapter. All right, little man. Or this section. Okay. Here we go, guys. I'm back. I'm back. We ended up right here, about, especially during the period of bondage in Egypt. Okay. Finally... It goes on to say, in God's perfect timing, he brings the nation out of Egypt with the greatest series of miracles known in the entire Old Testament. This event is called the Exodus, meaning a going out, since it constitutes the miraculous birth of the nation. It is to this great act of redemption that the nation always looks back as the foremost example of God's care for his people. So yeah, you heard about the plagues and the Red Sea and stuff. So that was, um, this breakout section has to deal with verse four, which reads again, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell all his power and the mighty miracles he did. 
So it goes on to say here, once God has redeemed Israel, he establishes his covenant with them at Mount Sinai. From that point forward, the nation is truly the Lord's possession and he is their God. The covenant foretells gracious blessings for obedience and severe judgments for disobedience. The rest of Israel's history demonstrates the certainty of their prophecy through the periods of conquest, judges, monarchy, exile, restoration, and Gentile domination. Israel is blessed when she obeys and judges when she disobeys. The nation is finally destroyed in AD 70, although this event is not described in the New Testament. Many prophecies, however, promise a future redemption for Israel. The practical value of studying Israel's history is threefold. And there's A, B, and C here. Letter A says it sets forth examples to be followed or avoided, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. It shows God's control of all historical events and that he was able to deal with Israel as he chose, Psalm 78. And it serves as a model for all ages of God's kindness and mercy towards his people, Psalm 103, verse 14. So those are some verses that can explain those um, reasons why we should study Israel's history. So again, thank you for listening. I just wanted to circle back around and finish reading that for you. Again, as always, always remember, true healing begins with self-love. Why? Because God is love and Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Good morning, Nova. Bye for now.